Get seated. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 28 this morning. If you're using the Brown Q Bibles, that's going to be on page 694. So go ahead and open your Bibles so you can follow along with me in just a little bit. The young man stopped by his parents' home one day on a Saturday afternoon. He walked around to the back. Is my microphone going in and out again? All right. Are the other micro are any of the other microphones on, Marty? No. Nope. Right. You said if I walk over here, it goes out. No. All right. We'll try it like this. It's hard for me to stand still. All right. Reminds me of that joke about the preacher that's walking around with a handheld microphone and he had the cord and he'd walk from one side of the stage to the other. He'd pull that cord along with him and he was going back and forth. This little girl sitting in her mom's lap turned around and she said, Mom, if he gets loose, will he hurt us? <laughs> anyway. Young man goes to his parents' house one Saturday afternoon and he goes around into the backyard where he knows his dad is going to be working in his shed. And the dad looks up and is kind of surprised that the young man is there because just a couple of months ago, this young man got married and he and his bride were inseparable. I mean, they were you know, childhood sweethearts and everything. And so he had never seen his son without his new bride until that day. And so he looked at him and he said, Hey, son, what are you doing here on a Saturday? And where's my lovely daughter? Young boy kind of Stop for a minute, and he just busts out crying. He said, Dad, I just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I, mean, I can't do it anymore, Dad. And the dad is just shocked. I mean, th these two were made for each other. And finally, he puts his arm around his son, and he said, well, son, what do you mean? What are you talking about? The boy said, Dad, you remember, remember the preacher made us say those vows? And he said, yeah, son, I remember that. And he said, you remember that one that says, and I will go with you from this day forward? And he said, yes, son, I understand. He said, well, I just can't do it anymore now. I can't go with her anymore. And the dad, I mean, he's just confused. And finally he said, well, son, where'd she go that you can't go with her? Shopping, Dad. Every Saturday it's to the mall or a longer burger basket party or a Mary Kay party or a pampered chef party. Dad, I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> you know, sometimes the, the words we say, the commitments that we make can come back to get us hit. And sometimes we don't even understand the full extent of what we have committed to until a little bit down the road from after we make that commitment. And I think that's exactly the problem Peter struggles with in Matthew chapter 16. You see, Peter, we saw last week in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter understood who Jesus was and confessed Him as Lord. The problem is that Jesus did not understand all that that confession entails. I'm sure Peter understood this like we would have seen it. You see, we need to, to understand the, the life of someone living in that period of time, and, and we can compare it to our life. See, in, in the Roman world, the Jews were trying to live faithfully to God, I mean, all Jews, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to please God. They wanted to have a good relationship with God. And yet the Roman culture and the Roman society was always there trying to pressure them into living the way the Romans did, worshiping the other gods, getting involved with all kinds of immoral activities that the Jews knew wouldn't please God. So not only did they have the culture pressuring them, but then they had all the religious divisions. You've got the Pharisees over here saying, this is the way you need to honor God. This is the way you need to worship. This is the way you need to live your life. And then they had the Sadducees saying, no, you need to do it this way. This is the way you need to honor God. This is the way you need to live your life. And then they had the Zealots over here who were giving them even another understanding. And so the people, they, they just wanted to live right to live a way that would honor God, 
But they have all these other influences. And we can relate to that. Because our world isn't very much different. The American way pressures us to gain wealth and prosperity and property and become successful. The culture around us pressures us to accept homosexuality and abortion and promiscuous sex and violence and everything else. And then there are, there are so many different churches, even here in the Quad City, all of them telling them, no, this is the way you need to do it. This is the way you need to be to be right with God. And the other guy over here said, no, you need to do it this way to be right with God. And so everybody going, well, well, what do we really do? What does God really want our lives to be like. Wouldn't it be great if God would just put someone here who could just make it all clear? Yes. Alright. And wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if God would establish someone who would wipe out all of the bad stuff in our culture to somebody who would teach Hollywood how to really make a movie? without the sex and the violence and the nudity and all of that kind of stuff. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yes. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Alright. Wouldn't it be great if we if there was if God would put somebody here who would wipe away all of the false religions in the world so that we could really live true Christianity? Alright. Wouldn't it be awesome if somebody was here that would just do away with all the greed and oppression and injustice in our land? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And see, and that's exactly what the Jews wanted. For them, that would be a king. Somebody who had the authority to just make all that stuff happen. For us, it's our president. We think we could put somebody up there that would just make all this stuff happen. And Peter wanted to be on that journey. I mean, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He's got to be the one who's now going to take that position, be that great king, lead us so that all of that other stuff is wiped away and we will have the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God, present once again. Peter was saddling up for that journey. I mean, he could... I, I, I just wonder if he laid in, laid in bed at night or on the ground or wherever he was sleeping <coughs> dreamed about this triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus on His big white stallion, sword in one hand, crown on His head, leading the people to drive out the Romans, to just shut up the Pharisees and the Sadducees and put them in their place and establish the true religion to make everything right. That's the journey. Peter, I think, had signed up for when he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I think sometimes that's the journey we want to be on to when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior. We think that's going to move us up a little bit. After all, it's going to give us the good life. If we're on God's side, everything's got to be good. Amen? Amen. Yeah, that's kind of weak. But that's the attitude that we as humans seem to take. And so Peter joins Jesus thinking that's the journey he's going to be on, but that's really not Jesus' journey. In chapter 16, verse 21, Matthew tells us that from that time on, Jesus began to explain to His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Now that just doesn't fit. I mean, if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then how can the elders, or the chief priests, or the teachers of the law do anything to Him? I mean, this is a guy that walks on water, feeds 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two little fish. This is the guy who drives out demons, calms the storm, and the snap of his fingers, he could wipe out all of these guys. But the text says that he must go and suffer at their hands. Now, how does that happen? It's like having the biggest kid on the football team being in the high school football team being beat up by a little bitty first grader. 
The reason I asked if Jerry was going to be here is I was going to use him as an illustration this morning. It would be like me and Jerry Burnauer climbing into a, a ring to have a mixed martial arts fight. Okay? Jerry is a little bigger than I am. Probably not much, but a little bit. But he's a lot stronger than I am, I can tell you that. And Jerry has trained in mixed martial arts. He has fought mixed martial arts. I fly fish. <laughs> the only way I beat Jerry up is if he lets me. And that's exactly the point here. Jesus must go and suffer at the hands of these men. The only way that's going to happen is if Jesus lets it happen. Jesus suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and then dying? What is it? He must die. That doesn't fit. Jesus is after all the son of the living God. That means he, should, he ought to be able to live forever too. You can't have him die. And I don't care how powerful and mighty and, and awesome and wise a king is, if he's dead, he's still not going to accomplish anything. And, and how do these people kill Jesus? The only thing that happens is if Jesus allows it to happen. And why? Why would He do that? You know, Him suffering at the hands of the elders and the priests and dying, you know, that's defeat. That's not victory. Peter, you know, when he proclaims who Jesus is, he's expecting victory, not defeat. How is Jesus going to get an army together to run the Romans out if He goes to Jerusalem and loses? If He goes to Jerusalem and is beat up by these guys and oppressed by these guys and suffers at their hand and then dies? I don't. Even if He raises from the dead, which Jesus says that He's going to do, even if He does that, He's still a loser. How will people follow somebody who is always defeated? Somebody that, that, that's a loser. And Peter, this is what's going on in Peter's mind. And he can't take that, so he calls Jesus aside. He's going to have some words with him. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he says. This shall never happen to you. Now, at first glance, we might look at this and see Peter loving Jesus so much that he just doesn't want his friends suffer like this. And I'm sure that there was some of that, but there's more here than, than just that. I think Peter is worried about power. He's worried about authority. That, that ruling kingdom that Jesus is supposed to establish, Peter thinks that that, that that is the most important thing in life. The most important thing in life, I'm sure in Peter's mind, at that period in time were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that Jesus is going to bring about. Definitely not suffering death and anguish. But look at Jesus' response to it. Verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Out of my sight, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now if you remember back in chapter 4, Satan tried to get Jesus to take his eyes off the journey that God had set before him. And now it's Peter who's doing the same thing. Peter is thinking like men of comfort and security and power. And if you think back, those are the things that, that Satan tempted Jesus with. First thing he tempted him with was bread, comfort. The next thing was, throw yourself down from this temple. The angels aren't going to let anything happen to you. That's security. The last thing is, look, every kingdom you can see out here, I will give to you. That's power. That's kind of the way Satan works. Kind of the way men tend to think. But that is not how God wants His kingdom established on earth. As we're going to see in our study of Revelation, God doesn't send a mighty warrior to fight the beast, but He sends a lamb. A slaughtered lamb. It's not with power and might. 
but it's with suffering and service that God's kingdom is to be established. This is the journey that Jesus is on. And that is the journey that He calls those who follow Him to be on. That's why Jesus goes on in verse 24. And then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for Me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what He has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Jesus said that if we would come after Him, we must do these things. They're not optional. They're not suggestions. And I want us to focus a little bit on some of these expressions this morning. Jesus says that, he, that anyone who would come after him must take up his cross. Now, when a criminal was sentenced to die, they had to carry their own cross to their place of execution. You shouldered the cross because you were going to die. It was a foregone conclusion. You were sentenced to death. And most of us don't like that thought of dying. In fact, we want to hold on to the life we have. That's why we go to the doctors and that's why we pursue things to avoid dying. We hold on to the life we have. And sometimes we not only hold on to the life we have, but we want it to be a little better, don't we? We want the good life. Our life's important to us. And that's why we protect it. For most of us, we pursue that good life. We want food to eat. We want protection against injury. And, and we, we like a little power too. You know, my kingdom is my home kind of an attitude. We like to be in control of our lives. We want to earn good money. Have a nice home. Have enough for retirement. Put our kids through school. Have nice cars. Have pets. Big screen TVs. Cable television. Starbucks coffee. We've got to have our life. That's what we pursue. But Jesus tells us that, that all of these things cannot be our priority. We're sentenced to die. If we acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we choose to follow Him, we're following Him to death. We're called to surrender this life, to deny ourselves and I want us to look at that denying ourselves for just a moment. You know, we live in a world that says it's all about me. It's all about what benefits me. It's about my own comfort, my own protection, my own power. But Jesus says it's supposed to be about God's will. It's about following Him and it's about totally surrendering our lives to the will of God and to walk behind Jesus wherever He will lead whether it be suffering or even death. It means following Him in His ministry to others. And Jesus in this text also gives two reasons why we should take the way of the cross. First, He says there's nothing in this world of more value than your soul. And if you spend all of your time all of your life seeking to gain the things of this world, then you will lose everything. It's kind of like that old saying that you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. 
There's nothing in this world worth our soul. There's that other saying, you know, the one who dies with the most toys wins. But that's not really true. What's true is the one who dies instead of seeking toys wins. The second reason that Jesus gives for why we ought to take the way of the cross is that the Son of Man is going to return. He is going to come back. But when He comes back, it's for judgment. And Jesus says that we will be judged based upon what we have done. Now church, I think this is important for us to grasp. We will be judged based upon what we have done. Notice he doesn't say you'll be based upon what you believe. And I don't think he's only talking about how often we attend church services or Bible studies or, or whether we did everything right in our Sunday morning worship service. I think it's going to be based upon whether or not we heard the words of Jesus and put those teachings into practice. Did we love our enemies? Did we give a cup of water to those who were thirsty? Did we give comfort to the hurting? Did we strengthen the weak and bind up the broken? Did we love one another? Did we go into the world and make disciples? And this means getting others to walk this same journey. It doesn't end at baptism and teaching them the right way of doing church, but it's having them walk in this way of suffering and death just like our Lord did. And I think we really need to, to think about whether or not we're doing these things. Daniel turned me on to a little video clip from Francis Chan the other day, and I thought this was just an awesome illustration. He said, and this is my paraphrase of, of his little video clip. If you want to see somebody that or see his, you can go online and just Google Francis Chan discipleship or something like that. But he said his daughter came into the house one day and he said, Sweetie, I want you to go clean your room. She looked at him for a little bit and then she walked into her room. When she comes back a couple of hours later and she said, Dad, I can I memorized what you said. You said, sweetie, go clean your room. I'd say it in Greek. <laughs> and, and I called some of my friends, and they're going to come over tonight, and we're going to sit around and we're going to talk about what it really means to clean your room. And he said, I'm sitting there going, I don't care, I want you to clean your room. Just do it. And I think that's a great illustration. Jesus says, go into, the, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And we say to Him, we've memorized it. We need to say it in Greek. In fact, we get together a couple of times a week to talk about it. And discuss what it really means. And God is saying, I don't care. Just do it. Do it! Jesus says He's going to come back and He's going to judge us based upon what we have done. Not what we've memorized. Not what we've studied. But what we have done. Jesus ends this discussion with verse 28. Very confusing verse, and I decided that I thought about just not even dealing with it, but that I think it is important. He says, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. The question is, what is He talking about? Because if you go, if you, when we get there in Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus says one time that He doesn't know when the end will come, and another time he, he refuses to set parameters about when He's going to come again. And so what does He mean here when He says some of you will still be standing when you see the kingdom of, of the Son of Man coming, or the Son of Man coming in His kingdom? Some say that, well, He's probably talking about the transfiguration that's going to take place about six days from now. And that may be, but... 
but it seems to indicate maybe it's something a little further out than that. Uh, some people say, and I, I tend to agree with this one maybe, that he's talking about the resurrection and the ascension. That that's when we really see the kingdom or Jesus coming in the kingdom and maybe that's true it could be the day of Pentecost when the when the power is poured out through the Holy Spirit that could be too the thing is we just don't really know but I think the point that Jesus is making to his disciples here is the urgency of what he's saying Jesus is the Christ he is the king and He is establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth, but it's not going to be done through power like the world does things. It's not going to be in elevating yourselves to gain entrance into the kingdom. But it is going to be about denying yourself, taking up your cross, following Jesus. See, that's what kingdom living is all about. You want to escape the pressures of the world around you? Do you want to escape the pressures of the American dream, the culture, the church division and politics? How many of you would like to really just not have to deal with any of that stuff? One thing you can do is turn off your TVs, turn off your, your radios, don't never go to a movie, don't be around people. <laughs> That's one way to solve it. But Jesus says no... I'm going to solve it by establishing my kingdom. And if anybody wants to escape that stuff, they just need to die. They need to take up their cross and die to all of that stuff and follow me. So this morning, I want to encourage you to pick up your cross and to live like you were dying. Not like you're still trying to make it in this world. But live like you're going to the cross. And the only thing that matters in your life is doing the will of God. So this morning, if you want to escape the rat race and begin this new life, and, and I'm going to tell you, it's, it's not a life of, of, you know, everything's going to be great, and you're going to be on the winning side all the time. You're on the winning side, but it's not always going to feel that way. It, it's a path of suffering. It's a path of servitude. But it is the way of God. It does bring you into His kingdom. And this morning, if you choose to come into that kingdom, where you will have eternal life, and we invite you to come down to the front while we stand and sing this song.